now my great pleasure to introduce Christina Yan Zhang, uh, International Students Officer of the National Union of Students. It is a very particular pleasure to um, introduce Christina. Um, we've had a, a number of events like this um, where we've had all sorts of people, people from industry, um, people from the top of universities, university principals. Um, we've had industrialists come to speak to us, but in these symposia, Christina is the first student to address us, and I'm delighted that you are the first, I hope, of a series of students who will talk to us. Christina came to Britain after taking a BA in China um, and enrolled on an MA program at the University of Loughborough. Um, she's now about to finish her PhD um, in civil building engineering, um, in, in which I'm truly impressed by your interdisciplinarity. <laughs> um, Christina was Global Development Officer of Loughborough Students' Union, um, and eight, 18 months after she initiated Loughborough's Going Global campaign, LSU was awarded um, the National Union of Students' Best International Students' Union and Best International Students' Event of the Year in 2009. She's had her work on internationalisation published by the Higher Education Academy um, and has won numerous awards and sits on a variety of bodies looking at the international student experience. In 2009, as an independent candidate, Christina was elected as the first international student to sit on NUS National Executive Council block, the, um, the first since its creation in 1976, and is now National Union of Students, International Students Officer, representing all international students in the UK. The, her aim, according to my biography here, is to globalise the experience of all 7 million UK students and to beat youth unemployment. Um, a phenomenal <laughs> aim. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce you and to have you come and speak to us today, Christina. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It really gave me great privilege to talk about graduate for the 21st century. I think we can first take a look at the definition of the 21st century. This century started from 1st of January 2001 and uh, finished at 31st December 2100. So basically, we want to get all the fantastic Scottish university to look into the future and try to produce the best graduates for the next 90 years. So actually, I think all of you should be really proud because you know, I, I, I'm sure what you're doing now can easily replace you know, Tom Cruise to lead Mission Impossible 4 because <laughs> it, it, it's not easy at all. But I'm sure we will have a happy ending just like Mission Impossible. And um, I would like to firstly have a look at maybe the outline. So it's generally we're talking about the information age curriculum, student body, how we're going to support staff, the future, and various campaign we're running. But um, I would like to borrow the Professor Castell theory about the network society, which is to explain some of the challenges we have to face at this moment. Manuel Castell is one of the foremost you know, professors in the world for communication. And between 1996 and 1998, he published his very famous trilogy for the whole information age, economy, society, and culture, which explains how the rise of various information technologies such as the internet will change our world and how the superstructures of our society will respond to that in the 21st century. And uh, according to him, the economy in the network society is a new capitalist economy characterized by information, globalization, and the networks. So firstly, it's informational. Productivities and competitiveness of people in this society will rely on their capacity to manage knowledge and information. And this means that the graduates university produced should always be actively involved in this ongoing learning and training process to keep their competitive edge. And the whole learning process doesn't stop 
when they finish their degree in the university. Therefore, all students should really be taught about how to fish rather than we fish for them. The second point is it is global. All the core activities, including technological innovation, production, distribution, and service, are all included in this globally collected network. So what does this mean? We need to really continue to promote the internationalization of UK education and the European higher education area, not only to try to recruit more international students to Scotland, but also globalize the experience of all Scottish students to cultivate highly skilled you know, Scottish workers who can speak foreign language and have overseas experience to lead various industries for this country into world leading positions. And the third point is, it's networked. The economy is very much interconnected now and it has a flexible way of producing information. This gives rise to a new form of economic organization, which is called the network enterprise, which is normally, you know, collaborates based on project across a wide range of different sectors. So for our students, we should really start to think about what we can do to prepare for this interdisciplinary collaboration they have to face in the 21st century. So for example, how can we help them to establish various network they could use for this lifelong collaboration? Can we build up the network between prospective students, current students of different levels, and alumni who are our ex-students but currently working in the industry? Of course, we need to talk about how we're going to make that happen. So on curriculum, I think, the first thing is internationalizing the curriculum. When we're talking about internationalizing the curriculum, I'm not only talking about traditional idea to include global content you know, in our curriculum, which is very important. We need to do more about that. But also, what I'm trying to propose is if we could explore ways to allow Scottish students to have the opportunity to learn another foreign language when they are enrolled in your university. Either we do that formally through you know, university language class or informally, maybe through student union language exchange, such as Tandon, you know, the very famous Edinburgh University Student Association promotes this kind of language exchange. It, it does work really well. And I remember David Willits, the education minister for the whole UK, once quotes the research from CBI in 2010. And he said 70% of the UK employers are not satisfied with UK graduates' ability to speak foreign language and have overseas experience to allow British industry or Scottish industry to compete globally. There is an issue about that. And in order to you know, solve this issue, he already proposed to get top 20 UK universities to develop joint degree projects with you know, leading university in China, India, Brazil, Russia, key you know, performers who are leading you know, the world for economic recovery now. And also you see some 1,500 companies already start to require their new graduates to speak at least two languages for them to compete globally. For example, JP Morgan. And I know many of you will say the acquisition of foreign language is the responsibility of schools rather than university. And if we want the more Scottish to learn foreign language, it should start from school. I completely agree with that. But I think at the same time, to prepare our graduates for the 21st century who are able to compete globally, university also can do more to bring a major culture change. So I can give you an example. I'm from China. Most Chinese students need to pass an entrance examination to go to university. In these exams, there are three major courses all Chinese have to go through. Mandarin, mathematics, and English. And because English plays such a major role in this you know, entrance examination, what happens is 
you know, it generates a craze among all the Chinese students to try to learn English as early as possible. And it's not surprising to see some of very young kids, maybe at the age of three or four, you know, they start to watch English cartoons such as Papaya the Sailor, <laughs> you know, where they try to eat a lot of spinach to make themselves strong physically, but also at the same time try to improve their English so they can score really high for the entrance exams to go to university. I'm not an expert on the recruitment process for Scottish University, but I thought this is maybe something we can start to consider. And um, the third point about international field work, I think maybe this is something quite interesting because normally we ask our graduates to maybe do their you know, field work, either dissertation or research in the UK. But I know there is funding limits to send them overseas. But if you have a look at the case study by University of Central Lancaster, they get like a few thousand pounds from British Council with PMI funding a few years ago. And what they did in a very smart way, instead of sending their student to China, what they did is get student in Chinese university, which they have, you know, international links, and get UK student here. They doing like a joint project together and using, you know, the latest communication, say Skype, this kind of thing to communicate. So they get UK students to develop some sort of uh, application for the mobile phones to put into the Chinese market. They get the Chinese students, you know, doing, you know, this kind of market research for the British market, and they collaborate. It worked out to be really, really well, and students on both sides actually really benefit from that. So maybe something to consider. Of course, we need to talk about student-centered learning. Oh, it's a little bit too quick. Um, I'm sure we have talked about that for quite a long time now, which folks on the student needs attribute interest and learning style, where you know teachers will be more like a facilitator for learning. But the problem is, it's not easy to have enough number of lectures and to provide a lot of you know, contact time to every single student to promote this kind of quite decentralized learning experience. And what I'm proposing is try to get more stakeholders in the education environment to share the very heavy responsibility of our academic staff to allow individual students to unleash their potential. So I, I think the first thing I'm going to talk about is on peer-to-peer -peer learning. I know lots of academics already, you know, arrange group work, group discussion, role play, etc. among students to promote this kind of P2P learning. And there are universities who set up like peer assistant learning to get final or second year students who are many undergraduate to support first year students. But I think, you know, that's a really great idea. Maybe we can do more. So what I'm proposing here is maybe we should link PhD students, master students, all the way to bachelor students who are studying the same subject areas together for peer-to-peer -peer learning. So for example, final year PhD student can support second year PhD students and can support a master student and any you know, level of undergraduate, it should be a piece of cake for them. And you know, masters can do you know, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer support to you know, any level of undergraduate and also final year can do first year or second year. And, and I think, you know, you don't really need to organize very formal P2P learning in that sense. Just get your student buddy up at the very beginning of the year, get them trained, and then ask them to meet maybe half an hour a week, you know, for a delicious coffee, or maybe, you know, one hour for a romantic lunch, drop down, everyone's happy. And uh, you see, I mean, we're always talking about the, you know, level of undergraduate and P postgraduate learning and the teaching might be different, but you know, in nature, they are still similar. They are always learning new things. And um, honestly, not everyone will be able to afford or maybe have the opportunity to do a postgraduate, but it doesn't stop them to, to be trained to think in a way like a postgraduate, you know, as if they have ever done a master or PhD. It's also part of the learning process we need to cultivate. And the second point I want to make is we should also link students study at the same levels across different subject areas together. 
And the key here is not only about acquisition of new specific knowledge for subject-based area, but also different ways of thinking. You know, if you talk to social and, you know, humanity scientists, what they normally do, correct me if I'm wrong, pondering on the meaning of life, to be or not to be, that's the question, you know. But if you talk to scientists or engineers, they probably will try to do more rather than think more. So actions speak louder than words, just like Nike, just do it. And if you're talking to business and economics, you know, specialists, they're probably all thinking about how to maximize profits, minimize risks. And if you're talking to artists, they try to appreciate the beauty of everything around them. So you see, the, the most interesting thing I try to highlight here is different disciplines will train our students to think in an entirely different way. Normally very specialized, which is great. But also at the same time, it could potentially, you know, put their thinking in a quite rigid way because it's too specialized, you see. But interdisciplinary training could extend the horizon of students and encourage them to think out of the box, which I think is very important. Not always in the same way they are many trained for, but also look at things from many different perspectives, you know. I think we'll will be really, really helpful to generate innovation and help them to prepare for the unknown future where lots of you know, knowledge will start just to merge and we got no idea what they are, but they need to prepare for it. Ah, that's the easy bit, use course rep. I know you, know you always like to set up all kinds of mentoring buddy scheme in the university to support students, which of course take quite a long time, maybe three months, to, to get established, promoted, trained, you know, implement. But why don't you give some more money just to your student union to support their course rep, you know? I mean, in, in most student unions, they already have hundreds of, you know, course rep recruited ready for you to promote peer-to-peer -peer learning. Why not use it? Make your life easier. Just spend a little bit money, you know, sort it. And also, you know, for alumni, when we, when every time we're talking about alumni, we immediately thinking about fundraising and overseas recruitment, which is important. But why don't you try to include your alumni, the ex-students, in the student-centered learning process? They have been through all the student experience, they know all the issues and they know the tips about how to perform well, but what's most important? They're currently working in related industry and they know exactly what employers and the industry need on graduate attributes. So get the mentor or buddy your current student can allow students not only to fully prepare themselves for the job market, but also give them a platform to put what they learned on academic class, this kind of quite you know, abstract academic theory into practice so they know actually how to use it. I think that's very important. And, and it's the same with, you know, employers, you know, mentoring. And I know lots of you know, universities already do that to, to get, you know, employer to mentor current student works really well. Ooh, this is my exciting bit. Hi. Uh, I'm sure, you know, talking about, you know, latest ICT for teaching learning, you can talk loads of exciting platform, but one thing I would like to highlight is the use of virtual world for learning and teaching. How many of you have heard about Second Life? Uh, pretty much everyone, quite a lot, which is great. So you see, for people who don't know, Second Life is a popular, multiple, multi, no, massively multiplayer online computer games, where users could create their own avatar to represent themselves in the virtual world and interact with each other virtually. Sounds a little bit, you know, futuristic. But everything, you know, is, in, in Second Life, or this kind of MMOG can usually generate it by its own user. And one big academic application for Second Life and other MMOGs is on learning and teaching. So you can see, actually, there are a lot of you know, publications already teach you, you know, how to use Second Life and this kind of virtual world you know, for immersive learning experience. I think the great thing about Second Life and all these kind of things is it can actually provide an immersive learning experience to allow students to interact you know, with their learning subjects 
and explore and uh, express their imagination, creativity in an unprecedented way and share that with peers and tutors. I think this is very important because it could fundamentally decentralize the traditional learning and the teaching process to really allow student-centered learning. Ah, this is a little bit difficult part to talk about. Change of student body. Well, with more Scottish universities start to charge 9,000 pounds tuition fee for the rest of UK students, maybe we'll see a drop of UK students in Scottish university. And also at the same time for EU students, currently they, they are still, you know, enjoy free education in Scotland, but I know there has been lots of pressure to try to challenge the European law because the rest of UK still need to pay 9,000 pounds. So the problem is if in the near future, you know, if EU students are charged the same as the rest of UK students, 9,000 pounds a year, they probably won't come too expensive. For international students, wow, something quite exciting, you know. Because actually, you know, they pay a lot more and there is no cap on the numbers by the government. But the Home Secretary, you know, put a, put a, you know, a cap on the numbers because unfortunately, international students are currently considered as counter war two thirds of net migration, which the coalition government is very determined to make their election promise. So probably we will see, you know, the rules will become more and more restrictive from now to 2015, the next general election. So in that sense, maybe we might see the decrease of international student numbers in this country, especially with the cancellation of post-study work visa, where Australia and Canada recently start to introduce their own PSW to try to get all our you know, happy international students to their country. So we have to be you know, quite cautious about how we are going to cope with that. So what David Willis said uh, at one of the conferences when I asked him the question, and uh, he said, relax, don't worry about it. You know, we can try to recruit more international students at our overseas campus, so no immigration you know, control whatsoever, uh, which I think is true, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't you know, campaign hard on the whole immigration debate on international students because they are just like, education tourists, you know. For London Olympics, there is no need to say you can't come because you, you come to our country to watch how wonderful Britain is, you know, for the Olympics and we set a limit, say you can't come. You know, it doesn't make sense. But still, you know, this is something we need to work really, really hard on. And also, I'm sure, you know, the fast information flow in the network society will require people to always actively engage in this kind of ongoing training and learning throughout their whole life. So it's very likely we will see more students will come back to university, say, a few years after they have worked in the industry, maybe get a postgraduate degree because this is something they think is going to help them to stand out a little bit more. And maybe in that sense, mature students will be, you know, more likely to you know, occur. So in that sense, how can we work with your individual student union to better support and engage this kind of quite diverse population who are not normally easily engaged because their needs is so diverse. It's not like just UK undergraduates, 18, 21 year olds, doing something quite similar on a daily basis, quite easy to cope with. Am I right? Sometimes, yeah. So yeah. That's about this. Oh, I'm going to raise something really, really controversial. Be ready for that. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of staff, staff support, the first thing I'm going to probably challenge all of you is about, do you think maybe we can have a review about how academic staff are promoted in this country? Well, traditional ways for academic promotions is very much research focused. I don't feel surprised about that. I mean, because the people who are benefit from it will be the whole UK education sector, universities and the academics themselves. So for example, if you know we look at the world ranking of all the Scottish universities, you know, it's largely influenced by the research excellence of individual of you. And also, you know, if, say, 
Scotland, you know, developed something really exciting like the ship, you know, cloned a few years ago by Edinburgh University. The whole world knows about it, how exciting, you know, they, they got the latest, you know, technology, scientific breakthrough. So this kind of things, research is something does help university to stand out immediately. If you're talking about teaching, it's quite difficult to tell the difference because normally, even if we're talking about student-centered learning in this country, across the world, it's still student-centered learning. We can't do, you know, something you know, slightly different, but not major breakthrough. So in that sense, you know, research is very important to keep our rankings up. So we need to keep that. But if you have a look at, you know, most, you know, academics, that how they got promoted, either the number of the PhD students they supervised and the number of academic journal papers they published, the more prestigious, the more, the better. And then the amount of research grounds they can bring in to their department, especially at this moment. So that's pretty much the job you know, description for most of the academic positions in this country. But what I'm proposing is probably at this moment, we need to have a more well-balanced mechanism for research and teaching. So it's not only going to benefit the whole sector and traditionally you know, university and academic staff, but also students. So in terms of teaching excellence, as you can see, maybe this is not specific problem with Scotland because education is still free. But for the rest of the UK, they start to charge 9,000 pound fees. And the uh, university actually are a little bit worried, will that put students off because not everyone can afford it. And uh, we keep on seeing, you know, all the news reports say, you know, the rise of, you know, students to study in Dutch university, German university, because, you know, they provide English language taught degrees with much cheaper tuition fee, or in Scandinavia countries, they're still free. So will our students be more interested to study over there? Because it's cheaper, it has a global dimension attached to it, and also increasingly China and India are trying to expand their whole you know, global market for overseas recruitment. And I remember when I met the Councillor for Education from the Chinese Embassy in the Parliament a few weeks ago, and I asked him the question, I said, will the Chinese government be interested to recruit more UK students to Chinese university who can offer English taught degree? He said, absolutely yes. And, and he said, you know, we have the plan to recruit another 500,000, you know, overseas students in the next 10 years. So we are under a lot of competition. And, uh, ooh, this is something I quite like. So maybe we should, so how we get this problem solved? Either we get academics to focus more on teaching. So what's Higher Education Academy currently doing for the teaching award? Are we going to do something, you know, to, to try to ensure if the academic staff want to be recruited for academic position, they need to have this, like a little, you know, certificate, say, they, they got this teaching award as part of their, you know, job description, maybe something we need to think about, you know. Or the other way around, we try to get students more interested in the research of individual professors. Because, you know, one thing I think which is really interesting is because you know, probably for undergraduate level, we, we try to, you know, it's more like information intensive, this kind of module will develop for them. But I believe a, a truly, you know, lifelong learning process should also focus and maybe include this kind of researchability. So if we get students to participate more in the academic research of their you know, professors, they can benefit as well because it teaches them how to fish for different things. So they got different choices to meet the challenge in the unknown world. And uh, this one, actually I mentioned that already because I generally believe this kind of, if when we're talking about student-centered learning, it should not only about learning of the textbooks, learning about this kind of traditional academic series, which is written down, it should be a holistic package. So student union can participate in the student-centered learning through cultivate them to do all these kind of soft skills, interpersonal skills, you know, transferable skills in whatever way you call it. But it's, it's more about preparing them for a well-developed individual as a person, as a citizen. And you can get you know, different departments, say career center, 
you know, talking more about this kind of employability and the enterprise office. Because we all know, you know, jobs at this moment is very limited. But if they become their own boss, say they invent something, they try to apply for a patent or maybe set up their own business, it's also they got a job. And it's, you know, very exciting, just like Steve Jobs, you know, creates, you know, the whole, you know, little apples in a garage and now uh, he's somewhere in heaven. <laughs> but, you know, this kind of things, you know, self starters does, does help, you know, students to have many different choices. It, it doesn't have to find a job. They can create their own job. So all these kind of things, the more you get different departments work together to prepare a student for a holistic development as a person, the better. And uh, of course, you know, my favorite bit about globalized, you know, old stuff experience, because they're dealing with students on a daily basis. If you really want, you know, your student to become global citizen, you have to mobilize, inspire, and, you know, make all the staff, both admin, IT staff, and academic staff, really, really excited about this kind of global experience, how they are going to benefit from them. So how can we do it? Either you send them away for research, you know, conference, or maybe send them to another country for some, you know, training program, learning programs, or maybe teach in another country, and then learn, you know, the best practice, say, in France, you know, in China, in India, etc. Bring back home all the, you know, better skills to ensure, you know, students here will benefit from their global experience. So, and of course, ongoing, you know, ICT training, things like Second Life, this kind of thing. And uh, what about the future? This is something I, I think, you know, lots of you have discussed quite a lot. And uh, we all know the current, you know, climate is not very promising at all. And uh, sorry, just spare me one minute. With record level of youth unemployment and how we can cultivate graduates to become more employable, it's a very popular topic now. But let us don't forget, universities and student union can do everything we can to cultivate a lot of soft skills to make our students more employable in the UK job market. But whether or not they could get a job upon graduation in the UK depends on how many new jobs will be created. And the public sector is currently undergoing massive cuts, which also creates redundancies with people who are very experienced. Do you think our recent graduates will be able to compete against them? Not easy. Possible, but not easy. So you see, the, the difficulty is, I mean, UK is one of the countries who have suffered most from the financial crunch. And this mainly because the banking sector, which used to be the leading sector to boost economic recovery, is severely weakened. And it's not easy, I mean, for the government to identify and promote a new sector to grow quickly in a few years' time to boost the economy. And the short-term solution, I mean, the government provided is try to reach agreement to boost economic power with China and India to get UK and Scottish business to export more. It could help to generate more jobs in the short term, but still, employers who conduct this kind of international business with China, India, they will need to recruit people who can deal with business on both sides. So you see, that's a problem. And currently, unfortunately, lots of people recruited by those companies are probably international students who study here, know the situation on both sides, and then they are employed but not many UK students because they don't have the competence to speak a foreign language or they don't even dare to have a try. That's a problem, you see. So what can we do? I mean, I think we need to globalize UK students' experience ASAP two ways. Either ask them to make friends locally with international students or send them overseas. Just imagine if all of them can try to make friends with international students now in your institution and learn as much as possible from them on foreign language, multicultural knowledge, etc. It will be a lot more easy for them to cope with competitors and customers in the world of global economy. 
That's also called internationalization, but it's not always happening here. Also, that's the easy option. And most of us go for the difficult option, send them overseas, which is great. So another crazy idea I always try to promote is we should really try to consider every single student on our campus is an international student, a global citizen. So in that sense, everyone can benefit from this kind of global exposure. This is one of my typical crazy ideas called send UK student overseas for one year and one day. One, one year and one day, you know, it's to do with net migration debate. Well, so, you know, the key debate at this moment is nothing to do with net migration, but it's all about managing public confidence during a time of economic crisis. Through effective measures, say, we try to boost economic recovery and create new jobs. And we want to bring the unemployed back to work and create graduate level jobs for young people and encourage establishment of small and medium sized enterprise. So you see, ultimately what we want to do is we want to cultivate highly skilled UK workers for UK industry to compete globally. And uh, I'm sure you heard about the whole debate about net migration. And one of the examples I always use is the Bologna process. You know, the target for Bologna process is to try to send 20% of domestic students to another country in Europe. And uh, currently we have 7 million, you know, UK students in this country. And if we try to meet the target by 2020, that's 1.4 million immigrants. And the current, you know, net migration is 200,000. So if we try to achieve that, that uh, still leaves us uh, minus 1.2 million for net migration. So what does that mean? It means something really, really exciting. For the coalition governments, they'll be really happy. Their election promise you will be met, although it's not an US position to help the coalition government to, to meet their you know, election process. You know, it's not our you know, responsibility. And for the UK business, they will be happy because they have 1.2 million highly skilled British graduates who will be able to cope with you know, global competition. And UK universities and colleges will be happy. Why? There is no need for any further restrictions. You know, net migration is already negative at 1.2 million. So you can try to recruit as many best and brightest international students and staff, no further restrictions. And also, you can recruit an extra 1.2 million international students. Say, if they each pay like 20, thousand pound a year how much is that you know it's like um, 24 billion you know that's that's amazing you know and uh, sorry just spare me one minute da, 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 da. ah the next bit is my favorite UK education sector will replace the banking sector to become the new major industry to boost economic growth. So we will be the number one. How exciting is that, you see? And also, UK people will be happy because there will be a lot, a lot of new jobs created with this 24 billion pound extra every year. And uh, you see, David Cameron signed a contract with China and India for two billion pounds last year for exporting. And if we get this sorted, it's 12, 12 times then, you know, two billion pounds extra exporting trade for the rest of the world. And also another thing I think we need to highlight is when he said exporting more, we are not only exporting goods, services, we can also export labor. Say, if we try to get some of the low-skilled British workers, maybe UK workers, to get trained in China, India, I remember meeting Wins Cable and he, I asked him some similar question. He said, when I was visiting India, the IT company there said, we are more than happy to you know, train all the you know, British graduates here because we have much better you know, IT skills, software, etc. And it's a lot cheaper. Get them trained overseas, you know, cheaper, and for a few years, work there. Bring back home all the you know, highly skilled workers and you know, make the economy booming. Why not? 
So students will be happy. They train overseas, you know, cheaper and better options. If you have a look, there are lots, lots of foreign people teaching, you know, English overseas, where you know the pay is really nice. And you know, they can traveling around, enjoy all the delicious international food. Very exciting. And also they will become highly skilled, you know, workers with foreign language skills, and they can become truly mobile on global stage. If the job market in the UK is not promising, they can get employed in China, India, and then you know they can move around, so they have more options. And also, you know, it's about extending you know, their horizon. They feel I'm becoming a better person. I know the meaning of life. That's really important. And also they think, you know, I can contribute to a better society of Britain because, you know, I can com come back home with all the international links and networks to help British industry to compete globally. So that's my slogan. Globalize your future beats economic downturn. Sorry, I update that. So not use unemployment. And uh, some of the campaign I'm running here this year, including immigration, global employability, especially about how to support international students to look for jobs when post-study work visa is cancelled, because we don't want to lose the huge 12 billion pounds annual income from international students. So we need to do that. Euro Future is all about you know promoting all this kind of you know our mobility through the whole European higher education area. So if you've got you know, people working in that areas, I'd like to talk to them. And also educating international students. It's actually borrowing from HEA, teaching international students. But I'm not only talking about plagiarism. I'm talking about how we can you know, really support international students to achieve the best possible academic results. So in that sense, they were still coming in all the time because they really have a fantastic experience here. And also overseas campers, if you happen to got one crisis, because the financial crowd still have a massive impact on the world now, so maybe we're going to see more in the near future. We need to be ready for that. And of course, Olympics, you know, get everyone excited. <laughs> so that's the overall campaign I'm running in NUS now called Global Future. It's trying to advocate the best global future for individual students, for people, for institution, for industry, and for different countries. I'm sure we all can have a really exciting global future. So the future, we have a happy smiley face, so it will be really, really exciting. Uh, if you want to contact me, that's my email address, and do feel free to follow me on Twitter. If you've got any questions, do feel free to ask. Thank you.